homage to the triple gem. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhasa Gurang dhammang sangang namasami So um, first of all, would someone mind closing both doors um, to the organ? Thank you. I don't think there's any on that side, although there might be. I find meditation's way more epic with a soundtrack like that. <laughs> it's fine. When Longpo Cha was meditating, there's often karaoke in the background of, uh, in Thailand in the countryside, and he would always say, you know, why do you think the sounds come and bothering you? Sounds just doing what it does. You know, you're going and bothering the sound. It's always a good reflection. And I find often if there's a distraction in your life, or even just a sound like something like that, if you don't push away from it, but simply allow it to be doing today with the five precepts, the invitation to the Dhamma talk, um, and more. I mentioned this before, but as in modern society, we understand well that you know our internal inclination affects our external actions, but we've forgotten that external embodied action can deeply affect internal inclination over time. So this embodied training is ritual. And it is very much a skillful tool we use. When we bow to these statues, it's just a statue. But what we're remembering with that action is um, what we're orienting our lives towards, um, towards the transcendent human potential, uh, the quality of knowing, which is the Buddha, um, or that clear knowing, uh, what happens the truth, the Dhamma, and what happens when that clear knowing knows truth embodied in a human being, which is the Sangha. And part of it's that we all, um, we all bow to something, whether we know it or not. And this is our making it explicit. And over time, you find that, say with the precepts, it's, there's these simple trainings, but they have an effect on the heart over years. Um, they're not always easy to keep. Uh, Ajahn Amaro mentions how he got a bland, brand new little house plant his first few years at Amravati, and it got infested with aphids. Um, so he was very distraught for a few days until he decided to stop keeping a house plant and start keeping an aphid farm. <laughs> so, you know, and uh, Ajahn Karunadamo, um, when he was a layman, he took on the pr uh, first precept to cease killing. And, um, you know, he still had some aphids in his uh, garden, but he would sort of take them and move them uh, to another place. And the garden wasn't perfect, but it was good enough. It was good enough. Ajahn Lee has said that uh, sila, virtue, is a metaphor for the concentrated mind. And all of these precepts aren't so much, um, more than anything, they're, uh, tools to make the mind bright and wieldy um, so that it can see truly and become um, more attuned to its deepest potential. And, you know, if you stop, um, say, crushing the bug as soon as you see it over the years, you know, and picking up spiders you find and carrying them outside. I lived with a teacher who would feed his leftover bread to the ants every uh, afternoon after he ate his meal. And you find that over time, your heart changes too. And the spider that you formerly saw as kind of uh, terrifying and ugly is now kind of cute. And um, I lived with, in my kuti, I had a spider in the bathroom. And in Thailand, they're about this big. But for a year, he was kind of, he was kind of my friend. Um, so these things do have an effect over time. They're just tools, but they're powerful tools. And we use them as such insofar as we're comfortable.
So I just came back from a trip to uh, Spokane in Eastern Washington, where I grew up, Spokompton, some of you might know it as. And it's um, a slightly different realm. I was also in Idaho for a bit of it. Uh, one of my favorite moments in Idaho was the first time I visited there as a monk. These guys drove by in this truck and said, Hail Buddha. <laughs> so that was good, that was good. But what I find is when you visit family, and I know several here have uh, recently visited um, or live with family and others, and I find there's a real skill in um, remaining with family and being with them and with others you know, from our past or outside of this uh, practice who don't quite speak our same vocabulary around spirituality and may not hold our exact same goals in mind for their lives. How do you move into that realm and not lose yourself? And even more, how do you find the Dharma hidden there as well? And for this purpose, I um, really have appreciated a sutta called the Akupa or Akupa Sutta, Anguttara Nikaya 5.95. And it goes something like this. A monk endowed with five qualities penetrates and intuits the unshakable. What are these five qualities? He attains discrimination in terms of principles, uh, Dhamma, or sorry, uh, Atta. Discrimination in terms of Dhamma discrimination in terms of language. Um, he uh, has a quality called patibana, which is variously translated as quick-wittedness or creativity, and he reflects upon the mind as liberated. So this was a bit confusing when I heard it the first time, but what I take it as is, is this. The quality of um, becoming, gaining discrimination in principles, in dhamma, in language. Um, I've heard it referred to in the Mahayana, uh, this list as the four kinds of eloquence. And eloquence in principles is the ability to tie everything back to these core underlying principles, to bring back a conversation or an experience back to the underlying uh, core of it, atta, um, this word used in the sutta variously means purpose, benefit, uh, meaning. And discrimination of uh, dhamma is in this list, um, the ability to, to bring things or connect them back to the teaching of the Buddha, the dharmic principles involved. Discrimination in terms of language, niruti, patisambhira, is the ability to eloquence of language, which is the ability to use words skillfully and in the proper way to convey meaning. And patibana, this creativity or quick wittedness, um, I've, uh, you know, I often think of it as this sort of um, glowing response to the spirit when you see of the spirit when it uh, responds with a sort of quick and spontaneous um, creativity to a situation. And these four kinds of eloquence um, were spoken about by Master Hung Shur speaking or pointing to his teacher, uh, Master Hua, when he engaged in these, um, basically these poetry exercises where his disciples would put forth four characters, traditional ones, and he would immediately respond with a sort of counter verse that uses and utilized the four characters, but uh, brought this sort of new perspective on them. And in a sense, I see this sort of creativity, this model as a meaningful way to approach situations and people and conversations which are very different and in finding a skillful approach to them. So, you know, uh, 
I went, um, I left my Kuti uh, last Friday, I think, and got in an Uber just in time. Um, someone called one for me. And the, do the driver and I got to talking, and he was a, um, you know, he used to work for the State Department and then quit because he didn't like where the administration had been going. Um, and he was a really devout Muslim, and he was uh, afraid to sort of speak about it for a while. But he began really talking about how one of the things he so values in Islam is they hold the text itself as sacred, which has led to less, um, you know, less fracturing of the teaching in his view, giving this sacredness and gravity to the text and the words and the original language. And so we, we got to have this beautiful discussion about his faith. Similarly, um, I was at uh, the lake house that my um, relatives own in Idaho, and um, they don't really know exactly what I am. Uh, you know, they're like, I don't think you can drink rum, right? And I was like, no, no, I can't. <laughs> um, but, you know, and on some level, you'd um, ask, where do you meet these people? You know, um, how do you speak to someone who ostensibly you're so distant from. And yet, if you look to this discrimination in terms of atta principles, the good, the benefit, the meaning, then can you find the good, the hidden gem, and the meaning in someone, in a situation, in a conversation? Because there's always a heart of Dhamma, a thread of Dhamma hidden in a conversation if you find it. And so for um, these particular relatives, um, you know, they're actually very devout Christians. And um, one, you know, will speak with uh, sort of Jesus on a regular basis. It's just part of her life is talking to her, her, her sort of buddy Jesus. And it's beautiful. And, um, you know, the chance to steer away from all the talks of talk about politics, um, about the... Uh, new um, ad, you know, the new four by four, the new uh, whatever, and carefully steer conversation towards, towards what's very meaningful. And I, I feel as if this aspect of these four discriminations requires a deep listening, because you have to find that thread in someone. What where is the meaning for them? Where is their heart? Because everyone has this in them. And how do you find it and touch it? And then once you do manage to kind of touch this, this good, this hidden gem in, in the situation that you might have missed, um, if you listen for it carefully, this is where I think you enter into the conversation with the following two, Patisambhira, carefully. And that is discrimination in terms of uh, dhamma and discrimination in terms of language, which is to say that once you found this core principle in someone, say their faith, what's held them through the death of loved ones, divorces, can you speak about you know, your own experience, uh, the Buddhist teachings a bit? Can you connect it in a way that's not heavy handed? And can you do that? You know, this is. Dhamma pati sampira, uh, discrimination, eloquence in terms of Dhamma. But can you do that using niruti pati sampira, uh, discrimination, eloquence of language? That is to say, can you speak their language when you do it? So when you enter into the, after you've found the good, the atta, the benefit, can you then approach it adapting your own articulation? using niruti, language, eloquence, but also holding your center and remembering the dhamma, the core of what you hope to bring to the conversation, dhamma, patisambhira, discrimination, eloquence of dhamma. And if we can do this, it opens up the world. Ajahn Kobila and I were walking to the ferry this morning and some woman um, stopped in her car and just, you know, she was like, can I give you two a ride? I just saw, I feel like passing a, like a monk on crutches is the worst thing I could possibly do. <laughs> like, that's the, what she said, 
That's the direct road to hell in this life. <laughs> and uh, in some rare way, I now embody two of the heavenly messengers, sickness and the monk. So I'm missing old age and death, but I'll get there. And truly, this road we're on leads either to heaven or hell. And it's the same, on the surface, it's the same road. It's the same day-to-day -day existence, largely, the same life. But what is that difference of noticing the messenger on the side of the road, of taking the time to stop and really listen to the, what the world is trying to, to tell you, to show you what treasure it's given you? I um, came back to Seattle uh, two days ago in late at night, and I was on the Fauntleroy Ferry Terminal at like 10.30 p.m. because my plane got in quite late, and then there was a Mariners game, and uh, getting out of the, the link tram in the middle of a Mariners game is, my God. Um, <laughs> but uh, there was one, one guy um, looked a bit down and tired, just sitting there with sort of a can in his hand and, uh, of sort of some soft drink, and just with his eyes closed. And as we walked to the ferry together, I said, were you, um, he seemed like he was sleeping when the ferry came. So I sort of tried to wake him up and he was awake. And I said, were you meditating there? And he said, you know, I'm, yeah, I'm a recovering alcoholic. Um, I'm just looking for something, you know, to hold my center. And um, his, we just had this conversation. He gave me a ride home. Um, we talked about his life, his sincerity of search, um, how he's had to give up all his old path for, something new and it was this treasure of a moment in the midst of a place i did not expect it at all and such gems are hidden constantly around us they did an experiment with joshua bell um, one of the foremost violinists in the world where they after he'd played uh, in new york to a uh, audience of thousands who paid hundreds of dollars for every ticket on a hundred thousand dollar Stradivarius. They dressed him in normal clothes and put him in the subway as a busker the next day to see what would happen. This is a journalist called Gene Weingarten. And they filmed it. And you see this man playing the violin and all these people just walking past one after the other. And it looks like he's a ghost. But then you realize that all of them are the ghosts. And what beauty lies hidden right below our eyes that we miss? So whether that's family, your Idahoan relatives, whether it's, you know, this man at the subway, um, at the ferry terminal, I was just visiting Servasti Abbey uh, for four days, this wonderful community of nuns and uh, a monk um, over on the east side of the state. And if you have a chance to go, you should. It's five hours away, beautiful community. And in the Mahayana, there's a conception of the bodhisattvas as beings that are able to split their consciousness and send it down as people, as situations to teach. And that is a powerful idea. So can you see every moment that comes your way as that chance? And can you approach it with that particular mix of listening for the benefit, the hidden gem, and find that in a conversation. And so often that's a gentle questioning and a real listening. But it does require some steering. People will constantly, even in Dharma crowds, uh, get drawn into speaking about this or that, the trip. Um, and can you gently redirect for everyone's benefit a conversation back to their hearts? and do it in their language, but also maintain that center of remembering your own principles, what's meaningful. And this allows you to not dismiss anyone and to find um, some path towards deep connection, dhamma, and uh, a meaningful relationship with, with family, with old friends, with everyone. And the final two qualities, patibana and reflection on the mind is liberated, um, I find most useful to just reflect upon in the sense of patibana it comes from the word to shine forth. In the sense that if you're really able to touch that 
sense with someone. There's a meeting um, in a very deep way that's joyful, spontaneous. And uh, this is especially important for us as, uh, in the Theravada because so many of our practices and our focus are on renunciation, on you know, lists, we love lists. And I think I've mentioned before Longpo Suchita says that Tibetans prepare for practice by doing a thousand prostrations. Theravadans prepare by do- having a thousand frustrations. And, you know, can we, um, can we make sure that even in the midst of a, a teaching which sometimes focuses on these practicalities, that we're bringing um, a real joy to it, a giving, a community, um, writing some poetry, drawing, you know, making some paintings, um, whatever it does is that provides that spoonful of sugar, because this is uh, quite intense medicine and many of us try to down the whole jar at once. And one of those helpful um, and joyful occasions is just seeing this field of blessings, this community come together. So uh, I'm grateful for that. Um, And it's a pleasure to have old and new faces here once again. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We decided we start to make our talks a little shorter. So um, this gives us more time for questions and answers. Um, so if people have things they'd like to bring up or speak about, uh, we can um, do it. And with this new setup, will people sit in that chair? You will sit in that chair. <laughs> And you will be recorded, I'm sorry, but uh, please know it's for benefit of everyone. And we're really trying to break down that barrier between the online participants and the people in here in present. So um, yeah, for those who are brave enough to uh, set out, it'll be appreciated for all. Judith. from the woman who offered it. Thank you. Who said the road to hell would be to not (laughs) offer a ride to two monks, one on crutches. (laughs) Yeah, don't, I'm not, if you've ever passed a monk on crutches, I'm sure you're not, you know, necessarily bound for any bad destination. Um, No, I didn't take it. I I actually have to refuse many rides every day. Um, So many people are kind. We were literally like 100 feet from the ferry terminal, so. (laughs) It was really sweet, but uh, yeah, yeah, thanks, Judith. (laughs) And if you're on the live stream, you can also type in your question and we'll have someone check and read it. If you're on Zoom, do we have anyone on Zoom? We have one person on Zoom. You are welcome to ask your question. (laughs) One person. talks about two kinds of suffering and um, I think the first type he talks about is the type that causes more uh, delusion and craving ignorance and the other one is the kind of suffering that leads to awakening and I was wondering if you could just talk a little bit about you know the suffering that we have to endure endure to um, you know uproot the defilements of the mind and what that process has been like for either of you. That's a great question. Just, um, yeah, what is the dukkha that might be part of the path? So the unsatisfactoriness or the things which are uncomfortable, which are actually, even though they are uncomfortable, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're not part of the path. 
in that quote that you have is not just from Ajahn Chah, but it also occurs in the in the Pali Canon that two types of suffering, one which leads to more suffering and one which leads to search. So like searching for an end of suffering. And um, yeah, I think for any bad habit that we have, um, you know, breaking, uh, breaking a habit is, is difficult almost inherently. And um, yeah, if we're deciding that we want to uh, experiment, we, you know, people bring up the precepts here and we say, oh, that might be a, might be a good idea. Um, if we're not used to keeping precepts, if we're used to, used to lying or used to using intoxicants or, or whatnot, um, then breaking that or, you know, doing something different can, can take some time and be a bit uncomfortable. It's, uh, but if you have it clear in your mind um, that what, why you're doing something, um, if you've got a, a higher, a higher purpose, then you can see, um, yeah, that you can endure through any discomfort that might come from, uh, yeah, from doing something which is you're not yet used to. Um, yeah, and this comes with, you know, various different aspects of the path, whether it's, yeah, keeping precepts, uh, or if it's uh, being generous, if you're not used to, you know, giving things away, and it's always, it can be, it can be difficult to, you know, you might want to, you know, keep that thing that you want to keep, and, and fair enough, you know, you have to be judicious about um, who and where and when you exercise, um, yeah, being generous, um, but maybe it's the right thing, maybe it's the right thing to give that thing away, which you, um, yeah, maybe don't really need, and then in meditation, I mean, you can all, everybody can see it, you know, as soon as you sit for five minutes longer than you're used to sitting, um, you feel the pain, you feel it, you can feel it both physically and, and mentally. And that's, yeah, the discomfort from, we're just not used to it, the body might not be used to it, but the body does adjust. Um, yeah, the body gets used to sitting a bit longer if you, if you push it. Um, if you're, you know, one of the precepts which some people take on um, is that eight precepts. So for monks, we don't eat afternoon at all. Um, and there's um, one of the eight precepts, so lay people can take these on uh, from time to time if they if they so wish. Um, but yeah, practicing. Well, maybe I'll experiment with that. Those guys, you know, seem like they're you know getting enough calories and they're not you know passing out or anything. So um, maybe you can experiment with that, and the body will get used to it. And but it is when you're you know changing your diet or something like that. It, um, it's not easy. So just pushing yourself and it makes yourself, it makes you stronger. It's like the, the pain of a new workout routine, you know, a new, if you're doing more push-ups than you're used to, um, if you want to get stronger, if you want to get more uh, upper body mass, then you're going to have to push past that. And similarly, if you want more strength of mind, um, yeah, you have to endure a bit, but then you get stronger and you see the results that, oh, actually last year I could only sit for 15 minutes, but now I can sit for an hour or something like that. So do you have any thoughts on that? Um, just for first of all, thank you so much for laying out like, uh, some specifics on things that are uh, kind of tending to be wholesome, interacting with family in a some way looking for that it's very helpful um and the question i have is just do you, is there any advice or teachings on uh, the use of humor i i haven't really thought through it but noticed that it yeah, that it, it could it could be complex and i don't know if there is a, an approach that uh, you think about when you talk to people and make jokes is that I don't know if it's a good idea or not. Thanks. Um, good question. There's a little disagreement in some of the interpretations of the first precept. If you would be of, or sorry, the um, fourth precept on not lying, whether, you know, uh, lying for the 
a knowing falsehood all uttered with everyone's knowledge that it's a falsehood, like an exaggeration would be um, appropriate or not. I, I tend to um, agree with the stricter interpretations that it's, it's best not to. Um, just because you find this with, say, sarcasm or something, is you can assume everyone's on board, but but often people don't understand sarcasm in in the way that you would expect, and you know there is misunderstanding. And um, that being said, I think the most beautiful humor comes from from truth. And there's a uh, the monks I've known who have the lightest minds. They 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 laugh all the time, you know, and um, so I think humor is really helpful. I think it's part of that spoonful of sugar. There's a type of wisdom called hasapanya, laughing wisdom. That's in the suttas, right? Yeah, so it's pretty beautiful, you know? Um, so yeah, I think it's good. Um, but uh, I think what's so interesting about this fourth quality of patibana, the quick-wittedness, how it comes out of these three quite analytical qualities of like looking for discrimination of meanings, discrimination of dhamma, discrimination of language, is that um, it almost emerges out of something much more grounded. And I find the humor like that really works for me. It's like, you don't have to go in. I appreciate this so much about the Buddhist teaching. I've been to some other uh, events, religious events of other denominations where there's a lot of like, you got to get everyone going right from the get go. And I love how the Buddha let us center you know, come to something really meaningful. And, and then you find that this quality of patibana, this laughing wisdom just comes up and, and it's right there. So that's my sense. Yeah, I mean, there are lots of different types of humor. And yeah, that fourth precept as we chant it here is I'll refrain from harsh, uh, from false and harmful speech. And other places, you know, the Buddha gives advice about um, yeah, not speaking, not only not telling lies, but also not speaking harshly, not, um, you know, gossiping behind people's backs, and not speaking idly. But yeah, I mean, it, that, that harsh one is, is dangerous. And like a lot of humor, um, you know, is quite harsh, you know. And if you can steer away from that, for sure, I mean, that's, um, that's really dangerous, and it, it's hurtful, and it sucks. Um, but I mean, you know, one realm, you know, is just stories. Like you've got these Jataka stories, which are, you know, kind of sub canonical, like, um, the Buddha gave poems, but then later generations kind of filled them out. So you've got this, you know, 550 or so stories, which are, um, kind of framed as being previous lives of the Buddha, but a lot of them are pretty fantastical and you could just read them as, as stories. And some of those are hilarious. Like, there's one of uh, this king who like employs this guy who's really good at flicking like things, you know, through like flicking like pebbles, you know, through uh, leaves in the forest. And then he employs him to come into the, uh, into the palace and then to hide behind this curtain while the king sits over there next to his minister who talks too much and he says, okay, hide behind, hide behind this curtain. And here's a big bucket full of uh, donkey poo, I believe, or, or maybe. So like every time the minister opens his mouth, flick a piece of donkey poo, you know, into the minister's mouth. And then when the bucket's empty, just shake the, shake the curtain and I'll come out. And you know, the king is talking to him and you know, the guy's flicking, you know, totally like you know, empties the bucket, you know, and uh, yeah, and then, yanks on the curtain and the king says, got you, minister. I mean, you talk so much that we just emptied a pot full of donkey poo into your mouth, you know? <laughs> and is that a real story? I mean, did that really happen? <laughs> it's kind of hard to believe, but uh, you know, some of, yeah, some of these stories are hilarious. Um, so there's definitely a long tradition of Buddhist humor. Ajahn Jeff has a book called The, the Buddha Smiles. Um, about yeah, humor that you find in the, the Pali Canon, which is kind of understated, but yeah, as Tanisabo pointed out, you know, some of, if you ever you know, YouTube Ajahn Chah, um, you'll just see the brightness of his, his face. And it's almost like, I mean, he could be funny. He could be hilarious. Ajahn Pasano said he is the, you know, the funniest person he's ever met. Um, but it's almost like he kind of just, he's almost radiating this hasapanya, this kind of, 
laughing or um, laughing wisdom that he almost doesn't have to say anything and is just um, shining it. So yeah, great question and a good good thing for all of us to figure figure out. It's quite important also to see like many of the teachings you'll read from the Kruba Ajans or Thai teachers, like they're given in this con cultural context of a lot of metta in Thailand and, you know, just to hold them in that context, like they're balanced there. Whereas if you take those fire and brimstone teachings to the West where we're um, many people or the modern age where many people are much more dour and, you know, hard on themselves, they can come across as humorless, but there's a balance to be struck. So Long Por Cha would, um, laugh all the time with his Western disciples because they were already kind of uh, tying themselves up in knots. We have a question from YouTube. Please provide some words of wisdom to encourage me for my upcoming trip and going alone to Nepal for the first time. Um, yeah, that sounds like it could be difficult. Um, I mean, Nepal is, you know, the place where the, the Buddha was born, Lumbini, is in uh, Nepal. So, I mean, you can always tie in, you know, Buddhist holy site into your, your visit, um, but... Uh, yeah, doing anything. I mean, um, one chant which we sometimes do is called the, the highest blessings. And uh, it starts off avoiding those of foolish ways, associating with the wise, honoring those worthy of honor. These are the highest blessings. And then the next one is uh, living in places of suitable kinds, pati rupa desa. So um, yeah, you do want to be, be wise about um, where you're, you're traveling. I mean, whether in the country that you're living in or in some other country and being safe about things. But um, yeah, also realizing what your reluctance or if you have trepidation or any kind of misgivings, is that uh, a good, like, is it a, a legitimate fear? Are you going someplace that's actually dangerous in your home country or in some other country? Um, or are you just afraid of it because you haven't been there before? and um, yeah, the Buddha said that, uh, you know, there are things which are suitable objects to be, to be afraid of. Um, but then, uh, it's almost one of these, you know, second, second arrow type things. Um, you know, there's the, the dukkha, which just comes from, from having a body, but then there's the dukkha or the, uh, the pain, which we add on top of that. Um, so, yeah, how much of your your misgivings is um, yeah, legitimate and how much is uh, something that you're adding on top and doesn't really need to be there. And I think for most of us, most of the time, um, we make up a lot of our stories and a lot of our um, fears are just, uh, just that and just kind of make-believe. So yeah, you have to look for yourself. Someone, uh, I think we have, someone to do we have time for one more question, Jessica. Oh. Thank you. I was wondering, um, in order to uphold the five precepts, does a person need to be a vegetarian? Uh, no, no. Um, in Buddhist conception, there's a um, particular scarring of the heart from actually the act of, of personally killing something. Like it, it's almost, it, it's a particular tearing and um, karmic um, burden. And so the precept is against that. Um, uh, actually directly taking the life of a being. 
Um, the Buddha, uh, for example, didn't um, prohibit his monastics from accepting or eating meat unless it was killed directly for them or they, uh, and they couldn't ask for it to be killed for them. And I think much of that was because he knew that for the Sangha to move into some areas of the world, like Tibet or fishing villages, it's just what people were eating. And it was more valuable for the Sangha to be able to be in those areas, um, you know, and, and spread, spread the, the teaching. Um, and for that to be viable, uh, then they had to be able to accept meat as well. Um, that being said, uh, I think, you know, I definitely know uh, some teachers who are vegetarian. Um, and um, I think there's a lot to be said for working with one's morality in that area and understanding the suffering involved in the um, food production system for animals. Um, it's very, very brutal factory farming. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it should be encouraged, vegetarianism. Um, and one relevant point to mention here is the reason the five precepts are somewhat narrow and very specific, like actually taking the life of a living being personally, is because the broader they get, the more you, there's exceptions where you need to kind of make them a little more vague. Um, for example, in some traditions, the admonition against intoxicants is also expanded to include entertainment, which is a really useful recollection. Um, but the reason it's not part of the precept is it can be, um, you know, there's times, you know, when it's, it's more okay to, to watch a movie with your family or something, you know, say you're visiting them. Um, but the five precepts are, are specific because they are things that, that really are, you can, you can hold with almost complete purity. Um, you know, and there's a power to that. So with the not lying, um, it takes skill, like you have to learn how to be able to speak without lying, but there's a real power in being in a relationship and your partner being able to know that they can ask you like, did you cheat on me? And you can say no, and that's it. They, they know it's done. Um, so all to say that, you know, the precepts are very um, core specific tenets for a reason. And I think there's great benefit in looking at expanding that scope as much as you can to encompass and refine the other aspects of your life and certainly um, how you get you fo your food and what you eat and vegetarianism or veganism would be one such realm you could approach that way. Does that sort of, okay.